Hello, I'm Nicholas Thompson. I'm the CEO of The Atlantic. It is my great pleasure to be here with Susan Wojcicki. She is the CEO of YouTube. We're going to be talking about YouTube's crazy last year. We're going to be talking about global governance. We're going to be talking about disinformation. We're going to be talking about how Susan spent much of the pandemic with five children at home, which is as heroic as running YouTube at this moment. So, hello, Susan. How are you doing? Hello. How are you? I'm thank good. you. I am doing well. You're good. Good to hear. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for having me and thank you to WEF uh, for hosting this event and thank you to the government of Japan for hosting the these global technology summit conversations. I appreciate it so much. So I just wanted to say thanks to everyone for making it happen. It is it is great that we that we get to do this even at this crazy time. So let, let's jump in. I just want to ask you a little bit about YouTube in the past year because we've all been locked at home basically watching YouTube, right? We started watching videos on how to make hand sanitizer and then videos of how to do arts and crafts. We didn't go crazy. Tell me the most surprising thing that you've learned about how people watch YouTube during the pandemic. Hmm. Well, I mean, first of all, I'll just say I never thought that we would have so many hand washing videos. Um, it was featured <laughs> on the Google homepage and <laughs> that's something I really could never have predicted. Um, but I mean, I just saw, and, and I felt it was a huge responsibility for us with the pandemic to be able to be, we were, I felt like we were such an important link for people to all kinds of information, uh, whether people were at home, um, they needed to connect to whether it was a religious organizations or social groups, or, um, you know, we saw musicians who came out and did big concerts. We saw bands come and post, um, historic coverage of concerts, um, it was just so important way for people to connect and, and learn. And, you know, one of the things probably that surprised me the most, which was really your question there, Nick, um, was how, in, how important we became in distributing COVID-19 information. And we immediately saw the role that we played and we just were, uh, we had everyone working at full capacity. So we served hundreds of billions of impressions of COVID information related to, you know, ways to, um, that came from different health organizations. And um, we also made sure that we had playlists, we had to implement a whole bunch of new policies, but we really saw the critical role that we played in health. And that was the first time, and, and working with health organizations, we worked with over 85 different health organizations. And it was really the first time that we worked so closely in the health field with so many different organizations for something that was global in nature. It's very interesting. And in fact, it leads right into the news from today. So as some people who are watching may know, YouTube made an announcement uh, maybe three or four hours ago about violative content, basically measuring the amount of content that violates YouTube's standards. And one of the standards you can violate is misinformation about COVID-19. So the question I want to ask about that is this new report is out. There's transparency. That's wonderful. The amount of content that people view that violates your policy is quite low. It's 17 views out of 10,000. Is that correct? Um, yeah. Yes. It, it's, it's approximately somewhere between 16 to 18 for 10,000 views. Um, so that means with my children, that means we probably see 16 to 18 a day. Um, but the question I want to ask okay. is, of the different contents of category that you are screening for, where you have policies that could be violated, hate speech, nudity, terrorism, what remains the hardest category to identify? They're all dif difficult in different ways. You've used machine learning to knock the numbers down. What is the one that machine learning still has the hardest time with? Hmm. Well, first of all, I just want to say, I think it was a really important milestone in terms of what we announced today, because we have been asked many, many times by governments, by press, um, by advertising, creator community about this violative rate. And um, we were able to show exactly how good we are at enforcement of our policies, right? So uh, we were be able to show that um, we have a very high ability to find this content and, and show exactly what that number was. Um, we were also able to show that we were able to um, reduce it significantly over time. Um, so if you look at where we were in 2017 at the same time of the year, we've reduced this more by than 70%. 
And that is due to an incredible amount of hard work with machines and uh, also improving our policy. So not only did we significantly remove content that violates our policies uh, at that significant rate, but we also created a lot more policies that we had to remove. And uh, I mean, I would say the machines are good. We can find content uh, across the board. But, uh, you know, something like uh, hate speech or so, something that has a lot of context would be something that would be harder from a machine standpoint to be able to detect. But in the end, we've been able to really fine tune our machines so that we can find a lot of this content. And it is flagged but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's removed. So what happens is the machines will flag it and then it will be sent to human reviewers who will determine whether or not this is in fact violative or not. And the catch is, or one of the, one of the complexities here is that this is content that violates your policies. It's not content that violates my policies or that fits some government's definition of hate speech. So a critique that someone could make is this is just what you think is bad content. There's nothing to do with what I think is bad content. How do you respond to that? I'd say there are two different conversations. So the first one is for you and I and governments and everyone else. Everyone, everyone seems to have an opinion about this, about what is the good content, what's the bad con content, what should be up, what should be down. So we engage with many different groups across uh, many different topics. And I'd say that's one conversation. But then we post very clearly and we say, this is the content that we have decided is violative of our platform. We post it on our community guidelines. And then that's a different question, which is, well, how good a job do you do at removing that content once you've identified it? And so you know, this report that just came out showed exactly where we are, um, you know, which is a 99 point you know, eight, five percent, um, depending, we have a little confidence interval, which is why we have this 16 to 18 range in 10,000 views. So um, it, it's our goal is to uh, break that into two different conversations. First, what the policy should be, and then do we do a good job enforcing them once we have those policies? Right. That makes a lot of sense. Let's shift to the question of good content, right? So sometimes there's, you know, there's there's all kinds of interesting content that you regulate in different ways, right? There's bad content, which you try to get rid of. There's borderline content, which is stuff that doesn't violate your policies. You try to downrank that. Mm -hmm. And then there's the content that we sort of want to see. And there's also the sort of this fourth category of content we're really happy we saw, right? So if I spend an hour on YouTube and I surf through YouTube and I follow the recommendation algorithm and I watch a lot of sport videos and, Maybe I see the late night comics. At the end of the hour, I feel like, oh, that was fine. If at the end of the hour, like I can solve a Rubik's cube because the YouTube algorithm has pushed me in like super interesting directions and figured out that I've always wanted to solve a Rubik's cube, then I'm thrilled. How do you think about incentivizing not just kind of run of the mill, sugar, not bad, but like the really good stuff? Like what's the exact inverse of the violative content? I look, I think one of the things I've learned working in information since I've been at Google for over 20 years is the broad range of interests that people have. Yeah. Uh, information is incredibly diverse. And what a lot of people love about YouTube is they can say, I went and I found this specific video that I used to watch when I lived in this foreign country, you know, far away, you know, 40 years ago, and I found it on YouTube. Or I had to fix something that was very specific in my house and I could do that on YouTube. So first of all, it's really hard to say this is a content that is really you know, great. Um, I think you started talking about educational content. You implied with the Rubik's Cube that, that educational content had this higher premium. Um, I'd say educational content is incredibly important to YouTube and that everyone, uh, almost everyone, comes to YouTube to learn something. In fact, we just had this Ipsos study that said um, over 77% of people said they came to YouTube to learn something. And just anecdotally, everyone tells me how they fix something in their house. But uh, I think, you know, what you're bringing up is one of these challenges is what is what is, you know, what is considered good content. We do classify when it comes to information, 
authoritative content. So if you're looking for COVID information, we actually can say, look, you know, the um, health organization, your local health authority, the CDC or whatever country you're in, or the World Health Organization, those are all organizations that we can trust as opposed to some channel that just showed up that we don't have any kind of authoritative information about. So we definitely have a concept with information about authoritative um, sources, and we make sure that when people are looking for information that is sensitive, that we show those authoritative sources. But if you're in the entertainment area, or you're looking to how to fix something or how to learn something on an obscure topic, it's really hard to put some judgment about what is the best content that's out there. Right. So on authoritative content, that makes sense because you can just label. And if something is labeled as authoritative, you can boost it. Yeah. Well, we do not just label it. Like, I mean, we have different, we have a more sophisticated algorithm in terms of how we identify that. And we also are working on a global component, but we, but it, we definitely do raise it. And we've done a lot of work in the last year to identify sensitive areas and make sure that we're raising authoritative sources on that information. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And by the way, when, when Susan speaks about fixing things, <laughs> I was listening to a podcast of hers this morning where she talked about watching a YouTube video to learn how to fix her 3D printer, I believe, which I thought was a wonderful um, anecdote. Or she, anyway, I thought that was a, a delightful story about how one, one, can, use, one can use YouTube. Um, the last time we spoke, which was at, or the last time we spoke in public, which was at South by Southwest, um, you introduced a, a new concept very much related to this, which is that when conspiracy information is shown, you would you know, show a panel with authoritative information and you would lead people to Wikipedia. Tell me how this has evolved over the last two years. Sure. So yes, we met almost what two and a half years ago, 2018, and I. Oh my told God! You, three years ago. Yeah, three years ago, and I told you that we were going to do label uh, content, and at the time that was a new idea. No one, I don't think we had actually rolled it out, or we were just in the process of rolling it out. Uh, and that became something that we now refer to as information panels. And those information panels have become incredibly important. I'd say they're a serious workforce in making sure that people have the right information and that we can uh, use to counter misinformation. So I'll give you a few examples. We certainly have used that on all the um, coronavirus information. Like, so if you look at something COVID related, we'll link to all different kind of health information, health authorities, depending upon what country you're in. Um, all kinds of common conspiracies, we'll link that. Um, for election integrity, we use that. Um, in COVID, we serve hundreds of billions of impressions that were different information panels. So we've come a long way, uh, Nick, since we first met. And uh, I'm hopeful that our VVR is also the start to something really important, which is more transparency and um, just an enhancement of, of our transparency report to understand how we think about violative views. Well, I wish we'd been able to announce the transparency uh, re re report on this. Um, uh, <laughs> I'll do better uh, next time. I'll, I'll work <laughs> on that, okay? <laughs> yeah, thank, thank, thank you so much. It's very important to be able to bring these things live with the, at, at the forum. So one of the things that to me is most interesting about the algorithm, and we wrote a long, you know, we wrote a long piece at Wired, my previous job was as the editor of Wired, um, yeah. about the way the algorithm had evolved. And one of the things that's so interesting is that every time you make a change to solve one problem, and there's some kind of an unintended consequence. There's something that you then have to catch up to. There's some way that behavior has changed. So there's some new thing that is incentivized. Tell me how you think about the evolution of the algorithm right now, where it is right now, what are the key things you're prioritizing and trying to fix, and what are the things you're worried about? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think we've come a long way in our algorithm. I mean, ultimately, we want to give information and suggest videos to our users that we think they're going to enjoy and want to see and related are to their interests. But there's a lot of caveats to that, too. So first of all, as I mentioned, when we deal with information, we want to make sure that the sources that we're recommending are authoritative, news, medical, science, et cetera. Um, and we also have created a category of more borderline content where sometimes we'll see people looking at content that is, um, or it will be content that's lower quality and borderline. And so we wanna be careful about not over recommending that. So that's a content that stays on the platform, but it's not something that we're gonna recommend. And so our, our algorithms have definitely evolved in terms of handling all these different content types. I'd say the, the plus of that is that our users are able to 
see higher quality content. Uh, they're also able to, uh, we're able to make sure that they're getting information from sources that are very reliable. But I would say the con of potentially some of these changes, because as you pointed out, every change has some downside, is it may be harder in some cases for channels maybe who are getting started or smaller to be able to be visible when there is a major event or when people are looking at something that is science or, or news related. But you know, I would say that that's a trade-off that we've made because we've realized that it's really, really important. So like we learned this lesson the hard way. So when we had the Las Vegas shooting, you know, unfortunately there were a lot of people who were you know, uploading content that was not factual, that was not correct. And it's much easier to just make up content and post it from your, your basement than it is to actually go to the site and to be able to report and have high quality journalistic reporting. And so that was just an example of, of what happens if you don't have that kind of ranking. So sure, we wanna enable citizen journalism and other people to, up, to be able to report and other people to be able to share information and new channels. But when we're dealing with a sensitive topic, we have to have that information coming from authoritative sources so that the right and accurate information is viewed by our users first. Well, that's, that's not an easy trade-off. I mean, your name is YouTube. The whole principle is that you, anyone, can have complete free speech and you know, publish whatever they want, or that was the founding principle. I would imagine that this is a trade-off that did not come lightly. So it's yeah, it, it is it 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 I lost you on the last second there, broke up a little bit, but you're right. Like we came from YouTube and YouTube I mean, when YouTube first started, it was much more entertainment. It was much more focused on creating uh like in, interesting things that you saw, funny videos, music has always been really big on YouTube. And you definitely want to be able to break the latest artists. And so that's something that we need to think about. So when there's a new, you know, we have so many artists who got started on YouTube. So when we have our next, uh, I don't know, some kind of some famous artists like Shawn Mendes or Justin Bieber who got started on YouTube and they post their video, we want to be able to enable those new artists to break. But if you look at that breaking artists or discovering the new latest um, small musician is very different if you're looking for something like cancer information. You don't want to see someone who is just posting information for the first time when you're dealing with cancer. You want to see it from established uh, medical organization. And so we, what we've done is really fine tune our algorithms to be able to make sure that we are still giving the new creators the ability to be found when it comes to music or humor or something funny. Um, or you know, so many different categories, beauty, uh, I, I mean, I, crafts, um, learning, how to, right? All these different areas, but we're dealing with sensitive areas. We really need to take a different approach. All right, let's move into the governance question of this since that is a big um, part of the, 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 of the forum today. Tell me, um, clearly there's a lot of conversation in, in the United States, but elsewhere too, right? I've seen it in Australia. There's a lot of conversation about regulating the big social platforms. You are. I guess lucky, though maybe unlucky, that you haven't had to have be subjected to a seven-hour grilling in front of Congress. But um, congratulations on avoiding that. Tell me, tell me one idea for one idea that has traction for governing YouTube that you think is a terrible idea, and tell me one idea that has traction that you think is a reasonable idea. Oh, <sighs> um, I mean, look. First of all, I want to say that I. I understand where governments are are certainly coming from, and we see I mean, we see government. We see so many different uh, so many different perspectives across governments, and I'd say generally we're really aligned with the overall approach. So, you know, we see governments who, you know, of course, we want to keep kids safe. We want to prevent. You know, violent extremism on our platform, and um, we want to keep our community safe. So all the laws around, uh, whether it's like uh, hate speech or child safety, those are all things like we're 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 working incredibly hard to figure out how can we work to do everything we possibly can. I'd say the challenge becomes when we get regulation that's that's very broad and is not well-defined. So something that is harmful, like what is hate? What is harmful? Um, those are not things that are easily defined. And 
you know, there are many, many different interpretations on that, depending upon what you're handling. And so I'd say the challenges we have when we, is when we have overly broad regulation that requires us to, to potentially uh, remove a lot of content that would not be um, good for, in the end for our users. And I, you know, I also say there's a lot of regulation right now that's happening where people are, um, I mean, we have this issue with what was Article 13, now it's Article 17, the copyright regulation in Europe. And we were able to make a lot of work in terms of progressing it with policymakers, but that was a case where we were really, really concerned if it had gotten too far the way it had been written that we really would not have been able to enable so many channels on YouTube. So I get really worried about any kind of regulation that causes us to potentially take down large amounts of content that is um, would hurt so many different creators. Creators are small media companies. They represent a lot of diverse voices. There are storytellers that, who need to be told they're creating a service with educational content. They're deploying jobs. I and mean, we just came out with all our GDP and job numbers, which are really impressive. So I worry always when I see regulation that would potentially cause us to hurt a lot of the growth that we've seen from the internet. And so I'd say we're aligned when it comes to keeping uh, communities safe. We want to do everything we can, and we want the definition of the language to be tight enough that we can actually comply in a way that is clear. And then we also have to just be really careful about the unintended consequences of uh, some of the uh, copyright or you know even like Section 230, like what could go wrong that could cause us to have to remove a lot of content that would be really devastating for the internet and for the creative economy. Do you feel like it would be possible to reform Section 230 in a way that would still give you the ability to filter content, give you protection against the possibility that someone posts something offensive on your platform, but that would solve many of the problems that lawmakers have seen in that very antiquated piece of legislation? <laughs> I mean, one of the challenges I have is, is that there are a lot of lawmakers who want us to remove more content and then a lot of lawmakers who want us to leave up more content. And so it's not really clear what is it that lawmakers want to solve for in the first place. And that makes it really challenging to be able to address. And so I, yeah, I think there are many ways to be able to address what the objectives are and we'll certainly work closely with them to try to achieve those objectives. But right now, it's not clear exactly what those objectives are. There seems to be a lot of disagreement about it. So until that's clarified, it's hard for us to figure out exactly what are the right next steps. But we'll be having, I think the, I would say the next steps are to continue talking about it and continue to try to define that more clearly uh, and come up with you know, come up with solutions that will keep communities safe, but at the same time will enable the creative economy and the jobs and the education and the huge amount of valuable media to continue to flourish and grow. And what is an example of legislation that you've seen internationally that you think of as sensible, balanced, and within the proper scope? Oh, um, I mean, I, I think maybe I'll start with like, you know, the net DZ, the first version of it had some really clear language around how we handle hate content and the need to remove that. And that was something that we also agree that we want to remove that type of content. Uh, we wound up actually first doing net DZ and then later expanding our hate policies. And so in many ways, it was useful that we had done a lot of that legwork for net DZ. So that would be an example of, of regulation that was useful for us and we're aligned on that. I think, you know, there certainly are, there's more policy that's coming there and we are in the process of understanding that and working through that. But the first version was helpful for us and you know, nobody, we don't want to have hate on our platform. We want to remove it and we want to remove it quickly. So that was something that was, that was uh, I think we were very aligned and we were able to work together on. Let me ask you a, a big um, global question, which is that one of the, you know, one of the, one of the most discouraging things to me about the the world right now is the is the technological split between East and West, particularly between the United States and China. Do you see any path to rapprochement? Do you see any way that ultimately 
the United States and China are able to figure out the issues that divide them on tech and that YouTube actually is operating happily in China some number of years from now? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure I'm the best person to ask about that because Google has never, I mean, Google operated in China for a really short time. And so I'm not sure that I'm the right person to answer that question. I, I, I just see, what I see about YouTube is just the humanitarian good that we are. So I see us as a global public video library and that we have a huge amount of content that people can learn how to do anything, whether it's skill or language or musical instrument, you can research any, uh, any kind of historical talk. You can see all the WEF talks here on YouTube. Uh, you can see all the TED talks. And so a lot of times I just feel sad if, if there's a population or a group who can't access that. And there could be many reasons for that. There could be policy reasons, but there also could be technological reasons. People who don't have access or they don't have they're not connected to the internet or data is very expensive in their country. So I see, the, I see the, the value of being able to offer this library. And so hopefully in some ways there will be more bridges built in the future. Do you have a, a set of things that if satisfied would tell you that it's time to go back into China or is it so far off in the distance and so out of the question at the moment that you don't even have that punch list? It's not something, it's not something I'm working on at all right now. There's so many other things that I am working on. <laughs> I have so many areas that I'm focused on our product, our innovation, we launched shorts product. I'm very focused on shopping, um, enabling more shopping on YouTube. I'm also said that responsibility is my number one priority. And as you can see, like we've made tremendous progress, but there's still a lot more work to do. So uh, I'm very busy just making YouTube a better product. And I am very interested in seeing the violative content report and seeing whether you can get that number down from 0.15 to 0.17 down to 0.10. Last question, you know, you're in well, Silicon Valley. I think Valley. we will. I, I mean, I'll certainly say that's a goal of mine is that we continue to lower that number. And I, our team will continue to work on it. And measuring it is always the first goal, being transparent, measuring it. Um, we also break down in our report just, you know, all the different ways, like how it was flagged. Uh, was it flagged by machines? How quickly we took it down? What was the category that was removed for? So I do think that the transparency that we have is a really big step. And what I like about this metric a lot is that it encompasses a lot of the questions that regulators had. So a lot of times they would talk about virality. Oh, you had a video, but it was got a lot of views really quickly. So all of that is encompassed in the uh, violative video right, DVR for people to be able to understand. And all work that we do should bring that number down. Well, I hope that you bring that number down by becoming better at finding bad videos and not by lowering your standards, which would be another way to- No, I, to no, 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 actually number. we're raising our standard. I mean, that's the thing right. to remember is that we have significantly raised our standard. I mean, just look at 2020, we had 10 different regulations on COVID. We had a number of regulations around civil, um, uh, around civics, uh, election integrity. So we keep raising the bar and we need to actually make sure that our enforcement is even better while we're raising the bar. And that's a challenge, but we're also, we're, we're staff now. We have the people, the policies, the technology in place. So I do see the opportunity for us to really continue to improve that over time. I'm just saying that as a new CEO, I know that KPIs can influence behavior in funny, funny ways, but I totally... I, I hear what you're saying, and that sounds like exactly, obviously, the right way to do it. Okay, last note, we have about 30 seconds left. Um, tell me something exciting. Actually, let me ask you this way. Are we going to be watching YouTube more on AR or VR a few years from now? Oh, I'd say AR. I'd say okay. AR. I, I, I mean, I, a, first of all, it's just, it's such a, so much potential. And I do think there's a lot of opportunity with AR in terms of modifying video, modifying creation of video, how we view videos. And the challenge, I love VR, but it's been hard to get the headsets and the content and get that ecosystem started. And so until there's a real breakthrough where one of them become a lot easier or cheaper, it's gonna be hard for VR, but I, it will happen. It, so it, there will be that breakthrough and it will happen. So in the meantime, I think there'll be a lot on AR and AR can go a long way. It can, I think we're going to see a lot of improvements with video, be able to improve our lives and have more tools with AR and have more fun. So 
I, I'm optimistic about the future there. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Susan Wojcicki. Let's all leave and go watch some high quality content on YouTube. All right. <laughs>